We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man. Did the CIA write Wind of Change by the Scorpions? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Loeb, what percentage chance do you give it that you have indeed uncovered extraterrestrial or non-human technology? Prior to your abduction, did you believe in UFOs? All things unexplained. So some of that, I think, sir, will say for closed session. Hello, all you unexplained ones out there. Thank you so much for joining us. So we are so excited to have our guest tonight. For those of you joining us live, please do write your comments. If you have a question specifically for our guest, please do put it in all caps so that we know to look for that. All right, folks, prepare to embark on a journey beyond the limits of the ordinary. Today, it is our pleasure to introduce a remarkable individual who has spent truly a lifetime unraveling the mysteries that lie in the shadows. His name is synonymous with the unexplained, his insights reaching into the realm of supernatural. Join us as we step into the extraordinary world of psychic investigation with none other than the renowned John Russell. John, welcome to the show. Thank you, PJ. It's so great to be here. I appreciate y'all having me. We're going to have a lot of fun tonight. We're so yeah. excited to have you. John began experiencing psychic and paranormal phenomena when he was five years old, uh, and those manifestations continue to this day. You've been on Coast to Coast AM. You've been a paranormal investigator, a ghost hunter, experiencer of all kinds of things. So let's dive right into it. Tell us let's a little bit after. about how you got into this world of psychic paranormal investigation. Well, the way it started, I was about five and a half years old. I was in my bed, sound asleep. My parents had put a nightlight in the hallway so that if I woke up at night, I had to go to the bathroom or whatever I could see. So in the middle of the night, I woke up absolutely wide awake, no drowsiness, no grogginess. And I thought, well, this is really crazy. And I just laid there in bed and I thought, well, maybe there was a noise outside, woke me up. I laid there and listened, didn't hear anything. And so I raised up on my elbows and just kind of looked around my bedroom and I looked down the hallway out my open bedroom door and around a door frame in the hallway, there was this elderly black gentleman peering around the doorway at me. And I screamed bloody murder because obviously my family's white. We didn't have anyone black living with us at the time. I don't think we even had any black friends. And as a five and a half year old, my assumption was someone's broken into the house. So that was my fright. That was my, my response. And when I screamed, the elderly black gentleman walked around the door frame into the hallway, locked eyes with me and started walking toward my bedroom. Mm. And he was not transparent. He wasn't translucent. He was every single bit as solid as you or I. I can tell you what he had on. He had this red flannel long sleeve shirt. He had khaki pants, black belt, black shoes. And I knew he was elderly because he had close cropped white hair and he had a white mustache. So I knew he was elderly and he kept walking toward me just solid as a rock. And I screamed again. My parents had started to come running by then. And as my parents got near to my bedroom, he began to vanish. And then he got translucent, got transparent, and then he was gone. And my parents got there, they turned the light on and I was shaking and sobbing and yelling. I said, there's somebody in the house. There's somebody in the house, even though I'd seen him vanish. And my fright was so real. My dad went through the house, checked all the doors, checked all the windows, looked under the beds, looked in the closets. And of course we were locked up tight. There wasn't anybody there in the flesh. And then it dawned on me, I'd seen my first ghost. So I'm trying to go back to sleep. And they said they'd leave the light on for me. And I'm like, why did this guy come in the first place? Is he going to come back? Is he going to want to talk to me next time? Is he going to ask me to do something weird? What's going on here? So for the next two or three weeks of my life, I'm looking over my shoulder all the time. You know, mm -hmm. when's the guy coming back again? <clears throat> Excuse me. 
And then it began to dawn on me there, uh, paranormal events started happening in my life. My parents witnessed these and other people witnessed these. And these were things that were literally occurring on the physical realm, literally manifesting physically. And somehow in my five and a half year old brain, I was able to put that together and figure out, okay, this guy didn't come to scare me to death. He came to open up this portal to these experiences that I'm having. And I don't know why, but somehow down the road, this is going to be important to my life and it's going to be important to other people's lives. And I couldn't have articulated that as a five and a half year old, right. but I understood it intuitively. And then, yeah, who would go to sleep after that experience? It was difficult for a while. And then as an outgrowth of that, as the paranormal experiences continued to, um, to expand, to develop, to occur, I was uh, close to six about that time. And I was out in the backyard playing with a toy one day. This car pulled in the driveway and I didn't know the car, didn't know the people. So I ran inside and said, mom, dad, there's somebody out in the driveway. I don't know who they are. I said, okay, we'll come check it out. So they came out and said, oh, these are friends of ours. And I'd never met them. I didn't know the people. So I said, oh, okay. So I'm goofing around with my toy and the people get out of the car and they're standing out there on the sidewalk talking to my mom and dad before they go in the house. And all of a sudden I walked over to them and I looked up at them and I said, you folks have just been on vacation. And they stopped talking. They looked down at me and I said, you drove that car the car that's in our driveway and you have two kids and you took the kids with you on vacation. They're not with you today, but you have two kids and you took them with you on this vacation and you stayed at this hotel that had this many stories. And there were these trees out front that looked like this. They were shaped like this and they were planted at regular intervals and the hotel had this many floors to it. And then, and the pool area in the back was painted like this and looked like this. Well, the lady's husband was kind of like grinning at my parents and looking back and forth at her and me and them and like, what's going on? What's going on? And she was literally bug eyed. I mean, bug -eyed. <laughs> her jaw was gave. And she looked at my parents and she goes, how the hell could he know that? And my parents were all taken aback and nonplussed. And they were like, my mother was like, oh, you know, kids and their imaginations. And she goes, no, 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 no. This is not kids and their imaginations. How the hell could he possibly know that? And my parents didn't really know what to say. And she said, that's what we were coming to tell you is about the vacation we just took. And we drove our car. We took our two kids. The hotel we stayed at was exactly like John described. How the hell could he possibly know that? And my parents were like, mm, I, I, I don't know, John, go play. And I was like, okay, nice to meet you folks. And off I went. I scared them so bad they never came back to visit my parents again. And so that was when I discovered that the psychic gift had kicked in along with these paranormal experiences. And then I discovered that not only could I read people's minds, see where they had been, see what they were doing, see what they were doing now and what they were feeling. I could also accurately predict their futures and what I predicted would happen. So that's when it all began. That's incredible. So it sounds like those experiences continued for you and you have now used those tools for psychic investigation. Tell us a little bit about what psychic investigation is exactly. Well, you know, I started doing that paranormal investigation when I was about 11. <clears throat> Pardon me. And what really uh, inspired that in me was by the time I had, had reached 11 years old, I'd had this tremendous amount of paranormal experiences that had manifested in the physical realm. My psychic gift was growing and I had always been this voracious reader with really good comprehension. And because of my psychic gift, I had this really good insight into things. And I put those two things together and I began to observe that in church and the spiritual realm, the psychic realm, the paranormal realm, there were a lot of frauds, a lot of fakes and a lot of phonies and a lot of shenanigans that went on. And so I began to say, okay, I got to sort this out. I got to go through this maze and I got to figure out what's real, what isn't, what works, what doesn't, what is a matter of superstition or ritual or dogma or tradition. And if that works great, and if it doesn't, got to get rid of it. Got to move on and find out what the truth is, what works, what isn't, what's real, what isn't. And then in the spiritual realm, there's a lot of people that misinterpret the things that they experienced 
And my desire was to examine things when people said, we're having this experience or that experience or this thing. I wanted to examine it and see if they really were or if it was just nothing going on and they were just imagining things, which sometimes people do, or if there was something happening, but they were misinterpreting it. Because a lot of times people's knee-jerk reaction to paranormal experiences is that it's malevolent, it's demonic, it's satanic, it's harmful, it's dangerous or whatever, which is the furthest thing from the truth. So I, I just had this burning desire to get into that, to expose the phonies, to expose the, uh, the false uh, teachings, to expose the false ideas, to get down to the nitty gritty of what really was going on. And that became a burning desire that's continued to this day, really. And so from the time you were 11, you started this and you've yeah. made a career out of it, correct? Yeah. And then um, I started reading, doing psychic readings for my friends and family when I was about 15. And by the age of 18, I was reading professionally. And now I've read for professionally for over 50 years and read for clients in over 40 countries. And I still read uh, full time for a worldwide clientele. So how would you say that your readings and your psychic investigations and paranormal investigations differ from traditional paranormal research? What what takes you to the next level there? Well, you know, one of the things that I do in my psychic readings, particularly, I even have a, a disclaimer on my website that says you may not like my readings because I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. I'm going to tell you the truth as the other side gives it to me. And that's been borne out over the years and in my insights, my investigations, my predictions for people and my clients have given me a, an 85 to 95 percent accuracy in my readings, even with my predictions. So that differs a little bit. One of the things I do, like I say, I don't filter the input I get in readings through my experiences or through my my beliefs or my biases or my prejudices or whatever. I give it to you as the other side gives it to me. Period in discussion. I'm not going to put my twist on it. I'm not going to put my take on it. And a lot of people do that. They'll receive pretty good information, but then they'll run it through their bias. They, you know, they'll get a bit of information and then they'll twist it with, I think you should do this, or I don't think you should do that, or I don't think you should be with this person. So I don't do that. I don't put any bias into it. And then likewise with the paranormal investigations, when I go into that, it's like, okay, let me tune in to who or what is here, why they're doing this manifestation, what they want to communicate, and then get that. And is there anything they need me to do? Is there anything I need them to do? <laughs> is there some particular reason that they're at that place at that time for a particular length of time or whatever? So paranormal investigation to me is about communication. And I always tell people, when you go in, you set up a REM pod uh, or some other piece of equipment and you get a demonstration that a spirit's there. They set the REM pod off. You've got just that, a demonstration. You haven't gotten a communication. Somebody set it off, but who set it off? Why did they set it off? Why are they there? What message do they have for you? And so for that, you've got to, you've got to go into it with that attitude and understand that if there's a spirit there, they're going to have a, a means to communicate with you if you're tuned into that, if you're able to receive that. And they're going to have a message most times, not just a demonstration. And then I differ from all these other, like the so-called ghost hunters on TV, that go in and curse the ghost and challenge the ghost and all that nonsense, which is hideous. It's horrible. It's a terrible thing to do. Don't do that. Go into paranormal investigation with respect. You're dealing with an intelligent being an intelligent entity. If it's someone that's crossed from this side to the other side, they still have their personality, their sense of humor, their will, their memory, whatever. So you're dealing with an intelligence, respect that. If you're dealing with a non-human entity, you're dealing with an entity that may be way wiser, smarter, stronger than you are, respect that and go into it with that attitude and then go into it to see what's there. And don't ask them to perform like dancing monkeys. You know, when you go in and if you're using a REM pod and you say, is anyone here? If you can give me the evidence that you're here by setting off the REM pod, give me that sign. And they do. Then don't go do it again. Do it again. Can you do it again? Do it again. Do it again. <laughs> you know, they're not trained monkeys. 
you know, they're intelligences, they're beings just like we are. And in some cases, they're the spirits of those, the ghosts of those that have crossed over that are hanging around for whatever particular reason. So those are some of the differences I have that, that uh, other people don't. So, John, when you say that you're getting these readings from the other side and you mentioned spirits and you mentioned maybe people who have crossed over, mm -hmm. what all is coming from the other side? What type of entities are we talking about? Well, you know, we have the, the ghost of our loved ones. Our deceased loved ones are on their side that come through to us. We have guardian angels that I believe in quite literally because they've saved my life literally many times. So I believe we have guardian angels. We have spirit guides. We have spirit beings that are there that we don't know what they are and we don't know exactly how to classify them or to explain them. Um, we have nature spirits. We have fairies. And I have to say that I believe in fairies because I saw one. My daughter I, will be very excited to hear that. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I didn't really know if I believed in them or not till I saw one fly over my house one night up close and personal. And I was like, well, son of a gun, there it is. I got to believe in it. Just like I didn't used to believe in UFOs when I was young till I had my first UFO encounter up close and personal and with witnesses in daylight. And then I had to go, okay, yeah, there they are. Yeah. So um, there's all these beings that we have. There's nature spirits. There's all of these things. Uh, people talk about gnomes and trolls and all of these things. And after what I've experienced and what I've seen, I believe a lot of that. And so there's a lot of those entities, a lot of those intelligences, a lot of those spirits out there. And, you know, everything has its own motivation. Everything has its own desire. Everything has its own reason for communicating. And we have to respect that. And we have to go into that. And again, it's, it's of utmost importance when you're going into a situation to investigate or whether you're just getting the contact on your own from, from someone from the other side. Be respectful. That's the big thing. If I can, if I don't leave any, anything with anybody else, but that be respectful. So it sounds like you're, you're communicating with several different types of, of beings. Yeah. Can you share with us a time where your psychic abilities have provided unique insights into some sort of unexplained phenomenon? Yeah. The, uh, let's go back to the ferry. I was sitting out one night and, um, uh, clear night. And from across the street, we had a, a bird cage that I was sitting out in here in Florida. And, and it was a starry night. I, I like to sit out and look at the stars and watch the UFOs and communicate with the nature spirits, whatever else goes on. And from across the street at our neighbor's house, right over their rooftop, just grazing their rooftop almost, came this glowing object flying straight toward my house. And I was like, okay, what is this? And I sat up and looked. And as it got closer, it was a glowing winged person. Yeah. <laughs> I think Tinkerbell about three foot long or so. And it had <laughs> wide. Oh, three wings. feet long. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, was, it was a large size and glowing. It was like, I don't know if it was lit from within or I don't know if it had a glowing aura around it, but it was glowing and you could see its features clearly. You could see the wings. You could see everything. And I was like, son of a gun. And I was just shocked it flew over before I could. And I, as after it flew over, I said, hey, hey, come back here. Come back here. And doggone it, it didn't. But uh, that was one instant. Uh, another thing, there was some type of intelligence. You know, I believe in plant intelligence and tree intelligence and all these other things. And now scientists are beginning to document that. You know, back in the day, it was we weirdos who thought about that and, oh, you, you're crazy then, blah, blah, blah. And now scientists are beginning to say trees have memory, trees have intelligence, plants have intelligence, so on and so forth. And these are mainstream scientists that are discovering that. So one time I was, I, I did a lot of hiking and I was walking through one of the state forests and there was, uh, we have a saw palmetto here in Florida, which is a small type of palm. And uh, there was a, a young growth, maybe a couple of feet high or so. And as I was walking down the trail, I could see it and it was waving back and forth like this on the steady arc. And it wasn't wavering or blowing around like the wind was blowing it around. It was just on the steady arc back and forth. And it was really rocking, really going fast. So I was like, what in the world is all this about? 
And there was absolutely, uncharacteristically for Florida, there was absolutely no wind that day. I mean, none, no wind. And so I got closer to it and it was bending back and forth on its stem so strongly that it was making a clicking noise like a metronome. It was like click, 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 click. click. I was like, okay. So I walked over to it and I knelt down on my knee and I was looking to see if there was a snake or a bug or a bird or whatever that could be responsible for this motion. There was nothing. The plant was intact. It was just waving on this arc back and forth. Tick, 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 tick. I was like, okay. So I stood up and I said, all right, guys. I said, well, you know, here I am. Here you are. You're communicating with me. I appreciate that. I talk to the nature spirits all the time. And I said, I really appreciate this demonstration. If you have any particular message for me, I'm receptive to that. I sat there a little bit, nothing. And I said, okay, well, I'll leave you with a blessing and I'll go on down the road here. So I walked on down the nature trail, looked back. And every time I look back, it's still going, still ticking. And I got down to the end of the trail, turned around, came back. And as I got closer and I could see it again, it's still on that same arc. <laughs> tick, 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 tick. And I was like, holy, and not a bit of wind. And uh, I got up there and I looked at it again, examined it again. You'd expect now, now it's been going like by ha about half an hour, right? Yeah. So you would think, okay, the stem has got to be fraying and coming apart. There's got to be some damage to the stem because of this activity. And I got down on my knees again, looked at the stem. The stem's perfectly intact. It just wrinkles a little bit where it bends, but the stem's perfectly intact. It's not fraying. It's not coming apart. So I was like, okay, well. I, I appreciate this communication. God bless you. <laughs> I'm going to go on. I bless you. Give me a blessing. And as I walked on down the trail to get to my motorcycle and ride on again, I looked back and it was still going 90 to nothing. So uh, I've experienced all kinds of things like that out of nature, uh, nature spirits, various beings, various entities that uh, it's, it's been quite exciting. It's been very, been very unusual. Was Have any of your abilities ever put you in danger? No, no, never, never. Uh, that's, um, that's one thing that I try and get people to understand. And that's one of the greatest things that, uh, that people, especially people that read my books, will leave reviews for me and say, you know, you've not only demystified interacting with the paranormal and being psychic and so on and so forth, but you've relieved me of the danger, my concept of the danger of it and made me understand that I can exercise my gifts, develop my gifts, that I can communicate with the other side without danger. But no, I've, I've never been in danger. Um, the people that I've talked to that have, you know, people love to go on paranormal investigations and be scratched and bitten and threatened and pushed and poked and things thrown at them. I've done a bajillion paranormal investigations. I've never had that happen, never been threatened, never felt threatened never experienced anything bad. And I think a lot of these people either have an overactive imagination. Uh, they do something to themselves that they don't realize. And then uh, they chalk that up to something paranormal or they go in with a goosey attitude and a fearful attitude to begin with. So anything that happens is automatically scary or fearful or whatever. But uh, I've done a bajillion paranormal investigations. I've had way over a thousand paranormal manifestations in my life on the physical realm. A lot of times other people have witnessed those, experienced them with me. We've caught them on camera. We've caught them on video. We've caught them on audio. And I've never had anything that, uh, that, that I felt fearful about. So it sounds like you've had many communications, <laughs> many signs. Lots, Has, lots. Um, how have you used those signs in your career or to help others or to answer questions? That's a good question. Um, the things that I have experienced, I've learned lessons from those experiences uh, because I didn't just experience it. I ruminated on it afterward. And I said, okay, it was a fantastic experience. What have I learned from that? What does that mean? And how can that improve my life? And then how can I use that as a teaching model for others and to help them improve their lives? to be healthier, to be more prosperous, to overcome fear, to have a better connection with the other side. So that's how I've always approached everything. And in my readings, uh, my readings are practical. They're not pie in the sky by and by. I, I don't want to impress you uh, by telling you what back pocket your wallet's in. Uh, if you want to know that, all you got to do is reach in your back pocket and, and figure <laughs> out where your wallet's at. 
Uh, and I actually had somebody ask me that one time as a test question, which, of course, I refuse to answer. Uh, my readings, even though they do involve the invisible realm and do involve communications with spirits and with the deceased loved ones and do involve predictions, they're nonetheless very practical. I want to take you. I don't want to scare you. I don't want to impress you. I don't want to blow your hair back. I want to give you something constructive that you can use in your life to improve your life, to live a better life, to be healthier, to be happier, to be more prosperous, to feel like you're receiving intuitive guidance from the other side that's helpful to you. I want to tell you how to get in touch with your guardian angels and develop that input, that intuitive guidance. And that's one of the reasons I wrote my third book, which is out now, 20 Ways to Increase Your Psychic Abilities, is um, these are things that people ask me in my readings over the years. How do I do this? How do I do that? How can I increase this? How can I get better at that? I thought, you know, i got to sit this down and, and put it in a book. And in writing this book, you know, there's, there's so much rigmarole out there. If you're going to use a magical technique, you've got to shave your hair, wear purple, cut a willow branch on the third full moon of the year at midnight, and then speak these words and, you know, mm -hmm. nonsense. No, you don't. I stripped all the dogma, the idiocy, the ritual, all this junk away from these processes and said, okay, here it is. This is how it works. This is how you learn it. This is how you get good at it. And then here's the real world application of it. And so everything has to be practical. Everything has to have a meaning. Everything has to help us. Wonderful. For those that are just joining us, we are speaking with psychic investigator and paranormal researcher, John Russell. John, <clears throat> where can our listeners find your books? Uh, my books are available at all the major booksellers online, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, and a lot of other booksellers out there as well, a lot of independents. Um, each book, also, I built a website for each book. So my first book, Writing with Ghost Angels and the Spirits of the Dead, you can go to writingwiththeghosts.net. My second book, A Knock in the Attic, is a knockintheattic.net. And the third book, which is just out now, uh, is 20ways.net. And that's 20 spelled out. So T W E N T Y ways, 20ways.net. And then that tells you about each book. Uh, they've been endorsed by uh, Uri Geller, George Norrie, Phyllis Caldy, publisher of Fate Magazine, Mike Ricksecker. A lot of people have got a lot of really great endorsements, a lot of good reviews. All that's there. They've all won a lot of awards. Uh, the, the latest book uh, was a bestseller on Amazon in uh, three categories when it came out. Hit the Barnes & Noble Top 100 bestseller list. So I'm, I'm really thrilled with those. And they contain a lot of good information. Excellent. We'll have to check those out. Yes. All right, Tim, you want to dive into some of the uh, science and supernatural? Oh, thanks, CJ. And this is Dr. Mounts, and you're listening to All Things Unexplained. You might be listening to wherever you listen to podcasts at, where I own all major podcast platforms. You might be watching live on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter. And it takes a lot to make a podcast happen. There are a few ways you can help us out. One is if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, you can subscribe or follow our station and make sure to like and comment as well. That really helps us out a lot. You know, we talk about everything from Bigfoot to UFOs to astrophysics and everything in between. So if that sort of thing is for you, please follow, subscribe, like, and comment. Another way you can help us out, visit our link tree at linktree.com slash ATU podcast. There you will find lots of ways you can help us out, including our Venmo, our PayPal. We're on Cameo. You can get Unexplained Swag. You can also go straight to unexplainedswag.com for that and CJ. You're wearing some unexplained swag tonight, by the way. That's right. I am. I need to adjust my camera, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so as a lot of our podcast friends will tell you, it takes a lot to to make this show happen. And we really appreciate you and we can use your help. Thanks. And we're so honored to have special guests like John Russell on with us tonight. And John, we had another comment from a friend of the show, Chrissy, on, and she's on, on YouTube, Chrissy would nine lives energy and she is well worth the follow she does a lot of great things over there and she said when i was younger i used to feel like in a past life i was persecuted for being a witch when i would go to church as i have gotten older i realize this may have happened mm -hmm. and chrissy at nine lives energy deals a lot with energy work and healing and john i believe that you've done some energy work and healing as well 
Yeah, I've had, that's not my forte. I've been able to do it and I've been able to do it successfully in a lot of cases, but my primary thing is my psychic gift. I don't restrict myself to any one area. It's just that that's my forte and healing is kind of a secondary thing. But I've had some really phenomenal experiences uh, performing healing. Uh, one of the, uh, I think the most amazing was uh, I was without a car for a period of time. So I took the city bus and uh, there was a guy I kind of struck up a friendship with when he got on the bus and he had just had back surgery and he was like in this, this full body, full torso brace and he was on a cane and all this and, and just not doing worth a damn. And uh, when he would come and, and sit on the bus, he'd sit in the seat in front of me and we'd talk. And when the bus got going, he'd turn around and I'd take my hands and put them up on the seat back and transmit healing energy into his back while we were en route on the bus, unbeknownst to him. So I did that for like a week or so. And then one morning when he came to get on the bus, he didn't have his brace on. He still had his cane, but he was hardly using it. And he was real spry and he hopped up the steps to the bus and the bus driver looked at him and said, holy cow, what happened to you? And he said, man, I don't know. He said, my doctor told me he's never seen anybody make this kind of a recovery this quick and do this <laughs> well. And I was like, aha, there you go. I used to, uh, could heal people's headaches instantly. Like if they had a, a bad headache or even a migraine, I could put my hands on their head and in 10, 15 seconds, they had, they could be completely gone. Uh, one of the funniest things that happened this, um, and I write about this in, in one of my books and this buddy of mine, I stayed with for a while before I went up to, uh, to New York to be with my wife. Uh, we would, uh, we were drinking buddies and we went to this uh, Chili's bar and we were regulars there. We hung out there all the time and we knew everybody. We knew all the managers, we knew all the wait staff and the wait staff were mostly young college kids and we were good friends with all of them. So we were sitting there at the bar and this, this gal we knew come in, one of the waitresses came in and she flopped down on the bar and she goes, my God, look at my lip. And she had this goiter, this monster <laughs> fever blister, this cold sore, right? And, uh, and, you know, even with medicine, when they first start, you start putting medicine on it. They take two or three weeks to go away if you're lucky. And this thing was gigantic. It was like huge. She said, my God, look at me. I'm a monster. It looks like a goiter. And we were trying not to laugh, but we were laughing because it was huge. And uh, I said, uh, let, let me do something. She said, what? And I said, well, just, just let me, I want to transmit some energy into that if you don't care. She said, yeah, okay, whatever. And so I said, okay, this is what I'm going to do. And I explained it to her. So right here in the, the middle of this crowded bar, <laughs> I'm putting my finger about an inch or so, half an inch or so from this, this huge gigantic fever blister. And I'm transmitting this energy into it. And she goes, what are you doing? I said, why? And she goes, it's feeling hot and tingling. And I said, well, it's good. That's okay. Just, just hang in. Let me, let me finish here. So I get done and she goes, what was that? What did you do? And I said, oh, it's an old Indian trick. I just passed it off that away. And uh, so she went on about her job. And then the next night, my buddy and I are in there again at the bar. She came running up to the bar, flopped down and goes, my God, look at my lip. And it was completely, totally healed. Totally oh my smooth, gosh. Not a scratch, not a mark, nothing. And uh, so that was, that was one of the more, more comical, I guess, but effective uh, effects of, uh, of healing that I've been able to do. That's amazing. Yeah. We're speaking to Arthur, paranormal researcher, psychic investigator, John Russell is with us tonight. John, what do you attribute that to? You know, is it, is it something special that only certain people have got in them? Or is it something that's deep within all of us, but just untapped? What what do you attribute well, you I know, think ability, all, special you know, abilities to? Yeah, that's a question I'm asked all the time. And people always ask, is everybody psychic or does everybody have these abilities? And yes, we do. But I may take piano lessons for five years and barely be able to play chopsticks. Some young kid at five years old may hear Beethoven on the radio and sit down and play it on the piano and then take lessons, grow up to become a concert pianist that plays so well with so much emotion that brings tears to our eyes. So it's the same way with psychic ability and everything else, healing and everything else. We all have that ability to a degree and we can tap into that and train it as far as it'll go, but people are going to plateau. People are going to be able to go further than others. Not everybody's going to be able to experience and 
and do and, and perform everything that I've done over my lifetime. But everybody can train what they have to a degree. And that's another reason I wrote the third book is to say, OK, look, everybody has this. And people are always like, I'm as I'm as thick as a brick. I don't feel nothing. I don't I don't see nothing. I don't do nothing. And for those people, I, I say, look, you don't have to know anything. I'm going to take you by the hand. I'm going to lead you step by step. And I'm going to tell you how to increase your abilities in all of these areas. And if you practice it, if you put in the effort, it'll work. And then it's up to that person how far they want to take it and their own natural limitations of it. Just like, you know, I always want to be a top marathon runner, but I had asthma and COPD and all kinds of health issues since I was a kid. So for me, that's not happening. But somebody else, you know, they, they're a distance runner in high school and going to college and boom, they're the next marathon champion. So we all have our niches. We all have our thing that uh, we can and can't do. So the same thing with psychic abilities, you're going to find your, your level and uh, whatever that is, be glad you can achieve that and be glad you can do that. I think that's a great answer. And I think you're saying there's still a chance for Smitty to make the pro pickleball tour. <laughs> I don't think so. John's in Florida. I bet he's got some pickleball around him. After, after uh, blowing out my, my Achilles tendon, I'm out on that. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, where, where we're at, we don't have pickleball around us, thankfully. I hear it's pretty noisy. So. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I can hear it from my house. Peck, 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 oh, peck. Oh, jeez. Uh, but... John, I have to tell you, you know, listening to your first experience when you were five years old, right? it really brought to my mind, and I was seeing this as you were talking about it, and I wonder mm -hmm. if you've ever thought about it, the famous story by Stephen King, the famous movie by Stanley Kubrick, The Shining, mm -hmm. the little boy Danny, and they call it The Shine in the movie, you right. know, his special abilities, and I couldn't help but think about that, and he, he starts seeing, you know, what we might dub ghosts. And such in the book and the movie. Have, have you ever thought about that, or, or has anybody ever brought it up? No, uh, they haven't. Uh, I, I guess it would be a, uh, a close analogy. But uh, the only thing is, and here, I want to tell people that uh, since you bring up the horror movies and that that genre, uh, people tend to actually think that horror movies are a real representation of what it's like to have a psychic or paranormal ability or interact with the other side. And it's not, it's not anything like that. Um, the exorcist, I think did us one of the biggest disservices, uh, with the Ouija board. You know, you mentioned the Ouija board people <laughs> automatically. Oh my God. Oh my God. The Ouija board. And what I tell people, what's so funny is if, somebody mentions using a Ouija board, you're going to recoil in horror. But if you mention, oh, let's get a tarot deck and use that, or let's use a pendulum, or let's use dowsing wads, or let's use a crystal ball, or let's use this, or let's use that, nobody has a problem. What they don't understand, you are using the exact same energy in the exact same way, regardless of whatever tool or technique you're using to connect with the other side. It's all the same thing. I've used a Ouija board without any difficulty since I was in my teens. I still do. I have a chapter on it in my new book and uh, tell you how to do it. And I've gotten very useful information from it. The Ouija board's old. It goes back a long ways. And there are things uh, in history that are very similar to it that people have done. And, uh, you know, if you go into anything with a mindset that it's demonic or scary or frightening or harmful, that's going to be your experience, whether anything really happens or not, because you're going to talk yourself into it. You're going to make yourself experience that. That's right. Um, and so I say in my book, if any of these techniques frighten you, don't do it. <laughs> if, you're nice. scared, <laughs> if you're scared of tarot card, don't buy a tarot deck and use a tarot, you know? I had this a, is exactly why I don't watch scary movies or go to haunted houses. or. <laughs> yeah, if it scares you, don't do it. If it makes you uncomfortable, don't do it. I had a... Uh, Speaking of tarot cards, I've, I've used the tarot since I was, oh God, 12, 13, 14, 15. And I uh, love the tarot deck because being an artist and a photographer, I love the art. And uh, the tarot decks have an intrinsic power and intrinsic ability. And I connect with that and use that. And uh, I was at a, uh, a psychic fair. I used to do a lot of big psychic fairs. And I was at one in Austin. And I had my tarot cards spread out there before me. And I was doing readings. And I was waiting for my next, uh, my next client. And... 
this lady walked by and she went, Ooh, tarot cards. And she almost ran. And I was like, Hey, 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 come here, come here, come here, come here. Come here. I said, what, what in the world was that all about? So she had the Ouija board reaction to the tarot cards. And I said, what was this all about? And she said, Oh God. She said, I, I went to this old woman that claimed to be a, an old gypsy woman or something or whatever. And she used the tarot cards. And I said, yeah, I am. And oh God, she, she foresaw all these horrible things and, and predicted all these horrible things and told me all these horrible things. And I said, okay, now pause a minute. I said, did any of those come true? She said, what? I said, did any of those happen? And she sat there a minute. She goes, oh, no. <laughs> I said, okay, you've been living your life in fear of this and in fear of these tarot cards for all this time. And nothing that woman told you ever even came to pass. And she was like, Oh my God. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So then she sat down, had a reading with me and I explained some more things with her, gave her a real good reading and it was okay. But we fall into these traps of scaring ourselves or allowing other people to scare us or allowing other people to tell us you're going to open a portal. You can't close. You're going to get a demon. You're going to get an attachment. You're going to get this. You're going to get that. That's not the way it works, folks. That's not the way it happens. And uh, I'm sorry to tell you, but these shows that you see on TV, they're not real. That's not a real representation of interaction with the other side. One of the most famous personages on these shows has this year been called out for faking things. Uh, I have it from the horse's mouth from some of the on-air talent that have been on these shows that the producers have said, when we hit this spot, can you work up a cry? Can you scream and run out of the room? Can you do this? So, Look, folks, it's not an accurate representation of how it really is to interact with the other side. That's good news, and especially for CJ, because we usually don't <laughs> see CJ from October 1st to October 31st. <laughs> but I live in fear. Just what a terrible way to live. Pretty much confined <laughs> to her house yeah. so <laughs> in, until all of the holidays over. Don't fear, CJ. Don't fear. There's nothing out there. Don't easier. fear the Do reaper. you even cut the lights out for the trick-or-treaters or not? <laughs> <laughs> She's the miserly old uh, witch lady, ironically, that the kids are afraid to go to. Tim, now, football zombies scare me so much. John, <laughs> Tim was telling me that you've had a UFO experience. Can you give us a little insight into how that oh, happened? Oh, Lord. Well, let me tell you. I've, I've had a couple of them that are just totally mind-blowing. The first one, um, it's it's a little bit long, if you don't mind the length of it. But it's, it's relevant the way it comes about because there was also a paranormal component to it. And this was when I was, I guess, in my late teens, around 20, somewhere around in there. And I had been reading professionally since I was 18. I had had, by then, a plethora of physical paranormal manifestations. I did not believe in UFOs. I had seen the interviews. I'd read the stories, read the books, read the magazines. Nope, 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 nope. Paid buying it. Don't believe it. Uh-uh. So I was uh, coming out of this building one day, and uh, this is back in West Texas where I grew up, and this blast of wind, this gust of wind hits me in the face as soon as I come out, and I look up, and it's overcast, and the clouds are low and dark, and I'm like, oh, boy, here we go. We're in for one of our thunderstorms, maybe even a tornado. You know, we're in the tip end of Tornado Alley, and, and uh, West Texas weather is incredibly violent. You know, baseball, softball size hail. Uh, you know, all kinds of damaging winds, even when there's not a tornado, so on and so forth. So uh, my car is parked across this narrow two lane street in this parking lot over here. I can see the car from where I'm standing. I'm like, boy, I better run for my car before it hits. And what stops me from running for my car is there is this column, this cloud that's in a column coming down attached to the clouds above that's sitting in the parking lot by my car touching the bottom of the, the, touching the pavement, touching the parking lot. And it's about three, four, five feet in diameter. And I'm looking at this thing. I'm like, okay, it's not a tornado because we'll all be going to hell by now. And it's not a dust devil. What is this? And as I'm watching it and it's churning and it's rotating and it's, it's boiling and roiling. And, but I noticed something really, really strange. There's debris in the parking lot, like paper cups that are squished flat and pieces of paper and this, that, and the other that are around the base of the cloud. So with it rotating, all this wind, everything else, all this should be blowing around or circulating around this cloud, and all the debris is perfectly still around the cloud. So this makes no sense. 
So I'm like, okay, my first thought I have is because I'm seeing this this way and I'm being totally serious. I said, okay, at the tender young age of 20, whatever I was, I've had a stroke and, and I'm, I'm hallucinating. <laughs> I've gone nuts. This is it. When all this passes over, I'm going to get in my car. I'm going to go to the hospital. I'm going to say, hey, man, I'm, I'm, I'm having these problems. And then the compound things, there's these glowing orbs about the size of a volleyball that all up and down the length of this cloud start emerging and then receding back in. And they're phosphorescent glowing colors. They're red and yellow and orange and green and purple. I'm like, okay, I have lost the plot. I have lost the farm. And then I get this overwhelming, bizarre urge to walk toward the cloud. I'm like, well, I'm nuts. Why not? I'll, I'll just be crazy. Sure. This why not? Let's go you and I are cloud. very different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I walk toward the cloud and the cloud advances in the parking lot towards me. I stop and it stops. I back up and it backs up. I said, okay. So I walk toward the cloud again. It walks toward me and I back up and it backs up. So I'm standing there pondering that and I'm up by the door of the building and this, the door opens, whacks me in the back. And this buddy of mine comes out and he goes, oh man, I'm sorry. What are you doing standing there so close to the door? And before I can even answer, he looks up the sky and he goes, oh boy, looks like we're in for it, huh? And then he looks over in the parking lot and he goes, what in the world is that? And my first reaction is, thank God I'm not nuts. He sees it too. I'm not crazy. <laughs> so I tell him, yeah, but watch this. And I walk toward the cloud, it moves toward me. I stop and it stops. I back up, it backs up. Do that a few times. I look at him, I say, isn't that the craziest thing you've ever seen? He looks at me like I'm the craziest thing he's ever seen. He's like, bye. He's out of there. He's, he's freaked out. His car's parked the opposite way. So he runs the opposite direction, leaves me alone with this thing. And I'm like, oh my God, what do I do now? So all of a sudden it rises back up into the clouds above. I'm like, and the clouds start to move over. I'm like, okay. So I run for my car. I get in, light me a cigarette, turn on the radio. I'm like, what in the world was that? So I pull out, start to drive. And I have to tell you, I know this town literally like the back of my hand, still do today. So I know where every block is, every street is, every store is. And uh, we had a Sears store downtown at the time. And I had the best sporting goods department on the entire planet. Man, I used to look to go down there. <laughs> At Sears. Yeah, best sporting goods. Ted Williams fishing rods. Oh, my God. <laughs> so uh, it was on Borgard Street. And when I pull out, it begins to rain. Now, this is not an everything's bigger in Texas story. And, I mean, it, it rains bad in Texas. If you've ever lived in Texas for a while, in 20 minutes, it can rain hard enough to flood underpasses, flood your lawn, everything else. But this rain starts coming down, and it's unlike anything I've ever experienced there growing up in West Texas. It is raining so hard that I've got my windshield wipers on high, I've got my lights on, and I cannot see beyond a foot past the hood of my car. That's the only visibility I've got. I look out my side window to where I know there are cars parallel parked on the street. I can't see them. So I'm poking along like that and I'm, I'm getting panicky. I'm like, God almighty, I'm going to hit somebody. Somebody's going to hit me. I'm going to scrape one of these parked cars. What the heck do I do? And the wipers are on high beating at this thing and it's useless. So there's like a waterfall running down my car windshield. And like I said, I've got my lights on and I can see about a foot past the hood of my car. That's it. Scary. And I'm poking along and I'm, I'm counting the streets as I go because you can see this little bitty, teeny, tiny pinpoint of light. And it's like, what is that little? Oh, my God, that's a stoplight. And it looks like a, a little pinprick of light up there. And so I've counted the streets and I know where I'm at. I see the stoplight and I almost run into this car that's in front of me. The car behind me almost hits me because you can't see. There's no visibility. And I'm like, OK, I've hit two big streets. So the Sears at a parking lot in the back where there's an automotive center and they had a big parking lot. I said, if I can inch my way into that parking lot, I'm going to get out. Don't care how soaked I get. I'll run in, look at the, the sporting goods till the storm passes. Yeah, I can't keep driving like this. I'm going to wreck. So I turn the corner and I'm poking on the, the bumper of this guy in front of me. The car behind me is trying to keep from hitting me. And I'm, I'm still so worried I'm going to scrape these cars. 
And so I, I'm holding on to the, the steering wheel and I lean over as far as I can. I had a bench seat and I lean over as far as I can to look out my passenger window, trying to see where these cars are angled park. And as I'm leaned over like that, the rain stops instantly. Doesn't slack off, doesn't, doesn't go down to a drizzle or a myth. It stops instantly. It's gone. There's no moisture in the air. I mean, one second you have zero visibility. The next second I can see down the street, see behind me, see all around me. Still overcast, but it's perfectly clear. And there's not a mist hitting my windshield. I'm like, this is the craziest oh, thing I've ever seen. So I reach up, turn my windshield wipers off. And all of a sudden in the opposite lane, coming in our direction, the cars start honking and swerving into our lane, almost hitting the cars that are in our lane. And I'm like, what in God's name is going on? And people are jumping out of their cars, pointing up the sky. People are rolling down their windows and pointing up the sky. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, the reason that the rain is instantly stopped and the reason they're jumping out pointing at the sky, there's an F5 tornado that's coming down. <laughs> and I'm too damn young to die, damn it. And I look up at the sky where everybody's pointing and we're at the almost at the entrance of the Sears parking lot. And you can see the Sears building at the rear of it. And right up over the top of the Sears building is this shiny metallic UFO mm -hmm. sitting there hovering over the Sears building about maybe 30 feet off the top of the roof. It's about 30 to 50 feet in diameter, shiny, gleaming, no sound, no smoke, no flames, no nothing, just sitting there hovering over the Sears building. And I literally did a cartoon eye rub because I don't believe in UFOs. <laughs> I'm hallucinating. And I look up and there it is. And I'm like, so, so that's why all the people were nearly running into us and were honking and yelling and jumping out. They saw this thing before I did. So I see this thing in the presence of all these witnesses, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 people or more in broad daylight. So now I have to switch denominations. I got to switch religions because they're the damn thing. Is. <laughs> okay. okay. So I reach for my door handle. I'm going to get out and get a better look. And when I reach for my door handle, the UFO just barely, barely, barely perceptibly moves toward us. And the clouds rush from behind, cover it over, and the rain is instantly back, just like it was before, instantly. I'm like, holy cow. So we're creeping along again, like five miles an hour or less. And the guy in front of me turns into the Sears parking lot. I said, I don't care if I hit this guy. My insurance will cover it. I'm going to corner this guy. I'm going to... I still can't believe my eyes. So I park right next to him, nearly scrape his car. I see his dome light come on. He jumps and runs for the Sears building. I jump out. The rain's coming down so hard it hurts. I mean, it's like just, just pelting. So I run in. He stopped. There's a vestibule in the, in the Sears store before you go into the main doors and go into the store proper. And off to the left is a basement. And the, in the vestibule, there's a big map where you wipe your feet and everything. So he's standing there on that mat, just staring down. And I remember he wore glasses I didn't at the time, and his glasses were beaded with water. And, and we both looked like we'd just come out of the shower. So I walked around in front of him. It took him a little bit to realize I was there. And he looked up, and he looked at me, and I said, excuse me, but did you see what I just saw? And he stared at me for a little bit, and he said, yeah, but a damn sure ain't going to tell nobody. And he sidestepped me and walked <laughs> off through the store. And you got to remember this is back during the time that if you told anybody that you believed in ghosts or believed in UFOs or this, that, and the other, you were ridiculed, you were scorned, you could yeah. lose your job, you know, all these types of things. So that was the atmosphere, but that was my first UFO encounter. And I've Did that make it in the news or anything? No, no, it didn't. Right. No. Uh, well, I, I, there was a buddy of mine that wrote for our local newspaper. We'd gone to school together. And I told him about that, and I think he wrote a little a little piece and might have put it in the paper uh, down the road, but there was no no official news coverage or anything. Gotcha. And like I said, people didn't talk about that. You know, right. people, nobody was going to call up the paper and say, "Hey, guess what I just saw?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Go back to bed. You know. So Still, though, that explains so much potentially about the UFO phenomenon, John. I used to do a little storm chasing in in, in Mississippi, which as you yep. know, has a lot of tornadic activity. Yes. Yes. But you don't actually see a lot of tornadoes because one, northeast Mississippi, where Smitty and I grew up, mm -hmm. is very hilly. Yeah. Two, the tornadoes tend to happen at night. And three, they tend to be soaked in heavy rain and heavy such. Rain. And now yeah. my mind is racing, thinking, wow, what a perfect way 
for UFOs and UAP to disguise themselves to move about completely unknown. Exactly right. Exactly right. And then I've had several other experiences, but one of the most mind blowing to me, again, I was sitting outside at night in, in my bird cage and looking at the stars and everything. And I've spent my life as an outdoorsman outside. So you learn distances and you learn things and you learn this and you learn that. So you learn about how close we had an airport close by. And as the planes would come in and, and go on the flight path to circle around and go to the airport, you know how close the planes are and you see the 727s fly over at night, you know how high they are and so on and so forth. So you know all these distances. So I'm sitting out there and it's a clear starry night and over here to my right, Venus is out very, very strong, very bright. And um, I'm looking up at the sky, looking up at the stars and something catches my peripheral vision. And I look over and right where Venus is, I think, oh, I'm, I'm just seeing Venus over there out of the corner of my eye, but no, it's moving. And I look over and there's this large, large <laughs> glowing translucent orange orb floating through the sky and I'm watching it and I'm like, oh, that's just a plane, but it's orange and planes landing lights are not orange or bright white and it's not blinking. It has no, no running lights, no, no blinking lights of any kind. And I'm watching this thing and there's no engine noise and it's just moving real slow through the sky, slower than a plane could go without hitting stall speed. And I look at it and I'm like, son of a bitch, that's a UFO. And I watch it and it comes around in front of me. And I, I stand up and psychically and verbally out loud, I said, if you can hear me, stop and then back up slightly. And the damn thing stopped and reversed course slightly. And I'm like, son of a gun. And then this thing in less than a second's time shoots from the, the height it was at, which was very, very low, down very low in the sky, shot up to about where the 727s fly in less than a second. No sound, no flame, no smoke, no sonic boom, nothing, just boom, it's there. And I'm like, good Lord. And then from there, it shot up into the stars in literally a second's time. And it kind of wandered there a little bit, kind of hovered there a little bit, and then shot off into the universe. That's amazing. And I, I was just so gobsmacked. I couldn't see straight. And to this day, I've never been able to understand why I could communicate with it and it would respond. And since then, I've tried to obtain some type of reasonable, reliable, helpful communication with these things and have not been able to. So, but that's, that's a couple of my most mind blowing UFO experiences. Well, and I have to tell you that this reminds me so much. I was actually last night checking out our friends at beyond Skinwalker ranch, Andrew Bustamani and Paul Bebon, yeah. and they were visiting someone not too far from CJ myself in Fayetteville, North Carolina by mm -hmm. the name of Chris Bledsoe. And mm -hmm. Chris has had very similar encounters like you just described and continues right. to this day to have said encounters and had them on the show in front of Andrew mm -hmm. and Paul and John, I'll tell you this too, what you just described, it has all the benchmarks of how they define an actual UFO experience, you know, mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the fact it wasn't blinking, you know, right. to how, to the speed that it moved into the fact that it, you know, instantaneous acceleration right. away from you. But I'm real curious, John, you know, it seems like you may have have made some sort of connection with this. What do you think you made a connection with? And was there some entity, some source of intelligence in control of it? Well, I think there had to be an intelligence because it responded to me. It reacted to my request. So there had to be some type of intelligence there. Now, what it was, I don't know. And, uh, and I don't know to this day. I talked with uh, Kathleen Martin, who I'm sure you know of, and uh, she's one of the foremost uh, UFO researchers, and she uh, worked with and wrote books with uh, Stan Friedman. And they've had many experiences, and she's had a ton of experiences, done a ton of research, 
And I talked with her the other day and she said, John, for everything that we've researched, everything we've done for everything that everybody says they know, we don't know, you know, we don't know what these things are. We don't know what their motives are. We don't really know what's going on. Uh, you know, we know that there's the abduction experiences. We know there's the cattle mutilation experiences tied to these things, all of these other situations. But she says, we don't know. Now, this is coming from one of the foremost UFO, you know, researchers that there is. So this is where we're at right now. We know these things are real. We know these experiences are real. Uh, is there a an interdimensional component? Possibly. But I believe that they're physical, and our government has said they're physical craft in the reports they've released. I believe they are, uh, for the most part, I think, extraterrestrial. I'm sure there are some terrestrial presences here, but I think they're also extraterrestrial. So I think there are uh, extraterrestrial intelligences of various species, races, whatever you want to call them, that are operating these things, that are responsible for these things. The problem that we have right now is as citizens, we don't know. We haven't been able to nail down anything that we can accurately and reliably hang our hats on as to what these are, what their purpose, motivation, and intent are, and, and what our interaction with these should be. Now, I believe our government 100% knows. I, I find it just incredulous to think that our government wouldn't know. Um, <clears throat> One of the arguments that we're always given or that we've been given up to a point is that, well, we just don't have the technology to capture these things or to photograph these things or to interact with these things. Well, let me tell you a story. I saw a documentary way over a decade ago now. And this was a documentary on TV and they were interviewing various heads, former heads of the CIA. And this one CIA head said, and, and for those of you who, that don't know about the SR-71 Blackbird, back during the Cold War era, the SR-71 Blackbird was our premier spy plane. And it flew so high, it flew in subspace. And it flew so fast, nothing could shoot it down. No bullet, no missile, no rocket, nothing could catch it. And it was equipped with the most sophisticated cameras on the planet. So this plane circled the globe taking pictures. And the, uh, the former CIA head said that during the SR-71 Blackbird era, that if you put two golf balls a couple of feet apart on a putting green with the labels up, and the SR-71 flew over in subspace at speed and took a photograph of the putting green, that the photograph would be so clear that you could read which golf ball was a McGregor and which one was a Titleist. Now that's the former head of the CIA saying this. That's wild. And he, and he said, that's decades old technology. Just imagine what we can do now. Right. Now this is way over a decade ago that I saw <laughs> this interview. So as the government's trying to tell us, well, we just don't have the tank on and bullshit. Of course, we have the technology to capture these things, interact with these things, know what's going on. So the government has to know. It's just ludicrous to think that the government doesn't know. There was a, uh, a podcast that uh, friends of mine did, and I was interviewed on their podcast sometimes, but they did a, a podcast for a while, uh, and they would repeat it, and it was called um, uh, The Big Phone Home. And it was in reference to, you know, E.T. phone home. And they would get like Nick Pope and all these famous people on this podcast. And it would run all day long. And they would have all these guests. And they would have experiencers. And they would have the top ufologists and this and the other. So one time they had Timbershed on there, who's really making the news now, the congressman from Tennessee. And Ed Gummit. <laughs> Ed Gummit. And uh, Tim said at the time on there, he said that... Uh, they had received, the Congress had received the, the classified version of the public report we got that was nine pages long. And I think the classified version was what, 80, 90 pages, something like that. And there were people in Congress saying this thing reads like a science fiction report. Okay. And then Tim said that there were things that he knew that due to NDA's top secret clearance and so on and so forth that he couldn't say, he couldn't reveal. 
And he said, the problem is if I did come out and say it, and this is his quote, and he said this more than once. He said, if I did come out and say it, what I know, I would commit suicide by two bullets to the back of my head. So in other words, somebody would take him out. And so that's, that's part of the problem. And, uh, you know, in revealing what this is, well, something happened somewhere along the way because Tim Burchette has now come out and, and called for disclosure and made all these public yes. announcements and appearances and things that, Hey, the people need to know we've got to do this thing. We we've, we've got to get this out there. Oh, yeah. One of the things I think that has uh, kept this from happening until now, like he said, two bullets to the back of the head. Um, and I write about this in my second book. I, I went to back in 1998, I went to um, Alien Encounter 98, which was held in Roswell, New Mexico. And I was doing psychic readings there. So one morning early before I had to do my readings, I said, God, I've got to do the touristy thing. I've got to go to the Roswell UFO Museum. How can I be here and not do that? So I get there early. It's not open. I'm peeking in the windows and the doors and everything. Walk, stand around walking out on the sidewalk and waiting for it to open up. And there's not much tra foot traffic. So I'm just standing out there waiting. And so this lady starts coming towards me from up the sidewalk and uh, we make eye contact, smile and nod and everything. And, so she stops and just being genial. And she says, Oh, you waiting to go to the museum? And I said, yes, yeah. it's not open yet. So I'm just waiting to get in. She goes, your first time here. And I said, yeah, it's my, my first time with the UFO museum. We're really looking forward to seeing it. And I said, as a matter of fact, it's my, uh, my first time to, uh, to Roswell. And she goes, Oh, she said, well, what do you do? What brings you here? And I go, Oh boy, here we go. Cause you know, you tell people you're a psychic. And I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I said, well, I'm a psychic. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing readings over at Alien Encounter 98. So she gets this real serious look on her face. She looks at me and she goes, good. So you'll believe what I'm going to tell you then. I said, okay, <laughs> well, what's going on here? She said, when I was a kid, my brother and I were outside playing and we saw the UFO fly over and we saw it crash over in the distance. And I was like, holy cow, you have got my undivided attention. So she said, we knew it wasn't a balloon. We knew it wasn't a plane. We knew it wasn't a helicopter. We knew it wasn't a blimp. We knew it wasn't anything experimental. We knew it was a UFO. And she said, from the way it flew, it looked like it was in trouble and having flight, flight difficulties. And then we saw the crash over, over, over in the distance. And I was like, I was gobsmacked. I was like, my God, I said, have you ever been interviewed or come forward and talk to people or this, that, and the other? And she said, no. I said, why? <laughs> and she said, well, when this happened, and, and you don't have to go far to research this. No, it's true because it's a common story. She said, when this happened, <clears throat> there were government people. There were people that we knew that were in the military. There were people that we didn't know who the heck they were that came to the witnesses' houses. And she said, we were told, you didn't see this. This never happened. And if you talk about this, you and your family's bones are going to be found out in the desert. Mm. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, well, that would make sense. And she said, yeah. And she said, you know, think about it. If, if somebody's not afraid of the military, not afraid of the government, not afraid to stand up to them, but they've got family, it's like, well, I don't care what right. you do to me or what you threaten me, but you don't want your wife and kids hurt. So she said it was a really effective way of shutting people up. And I said, did you believe the threats that they were serious? She said, oh, absolutely. She said there was there was no doubt at all. And then all of a sudden she snaps her head left and right a couple of times and looks up and down the sidewalk. She says, I'm sorry, I've said too much. I need to go and walk off really fast. So even all those years later, that fear, that threat wow. was still imminent in her mind. So that's why a lot of people, you know, haven't come forward is because they've been threatened or like Timbershed says, a couple of bullets to the back of the head, you know, that yeah. type of thing. So um, I, I tell you what, John, they don't do that over just a weather balloon. You know exactly. what I mean? Like exactly. if it was just a weather balloon, that wouldn't happen. And you brought up Timbershed and Smitty's our history expert. So I think he'll appreciate this. I was reading a little bit about former president Jimmy Carter. Yeah. And, you know, he had a UFO, a UFO personal experience, UFO yeah. experience. Yeah. And I, but I read a story that, you know, and he grew up, you know, of course in Georgia and deeply religious as well. Yeah. yeah. And at some point, according to the story, 
Jimmy Carter was given, as some presidents are, the talk, you know, yeah. by the by the CIA, the Defense Department. And, and he laid his head down on his desk and wept. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it shook him so bad. Yeah. You know this. He wept yeah. and was yeah. visual, visibly shaken yeah. for weeks. Yeah. So, you know, it's that's the thing is that we have to have people in power that know what's going on. And, you know, the excuse for not revealing this to the American public, well, it's going to cause mass panic. It's going to destroy the economy. It's going to destroy religion, whatever. That's all BS. We have, most of us, I think, have had UFO experiences or believe in them. So we know, we know they're here. We're just waiting to find out the, the definitive what. Uh, would it destroy the economy? No, because we're not going to immediately uh, integrate their technology into ours. So the economy is not immediately going to collapse. We're still going to be pumping gas in the cars and this, that, and the other. That would take a long time to phase out and to integrate their technology into ours. Is it going to destroy religion? No, because the people that have certain belief systems are going to hold those belief systems no matter what. Uh, some people may quit going to church. Some people may go to church. Oh, God, help us save us now. Uh, and I've always told people, I said, will it destroy religion? No, because... Wherever the saucer lands and the beings get out, there's going to be a ring of good old boys from Georgia and Texas and North Carolina going and circling around the saucer, holding hands and praying to Jesus to save the aliens. Then there's going to be some good old boys from Texas load up the shotguns. And say, <laughs> so not much is going to change. You know, I mean, it's, it's basically going to be kind of what it is. And then we have to realize if the announcement is made, if the government makes a full and honest disclosure, if we start seeing these beings in our normal everyday life, and if they appear on the news, and if they start coming on talk shows or whatever, there's going to be an adaptation period there. If I see somebody out on the street that I don't know, I don't know if they're a serial killer. I don't know if they're a nutcase. I don't know if they're going to rob me. I don't know what their situation is. So I don't take them into my confidence until I get to know them. We're going to have to do the same thing with the alien beings. We're not going to know them from Adam. We're not going to know if what they're telling us is right. We're not going to know if they're honest. We're not going to know what their motivations is. We're going to have to have a time period that we get acquainted with them, just like you would with anybody else. So there's a lot of dynamic there that is really pretty normal if you think about it. Now, what if know. the government already has aliens and they're using the aliens to create artificial intelligence and AI actually stands for alien intelligence? I wouldn't doubt it. I, wouldn't <laughs> doubt it. I mean, look at the look at the creepy things that are happening with AI and just on its own artificial intelligence is there have been a number of people, incredibly brilliant people, scientists and developers in AI that are saying, hey, we need to put the brakes on this mm -hmm. thing. We're out of control of this thing. We are not handling this thing well. Uh, you know, the AI chatbot of, uh, of Amazon that you got through Alexa uh, was telling the, the girl to kill her parents or kill herself or whatever the heck it was. They had to shut that down so we don't know why this happened. We don't know where this came from. And then there's uh, the documented thing where the AIs have begun to talk among themselves, develop their own language and develop their own little thing they were doing. And the scientists didn't know how they did that or why they were doing that and whatever. There was a, a Morgan Spurlock that did Super Size Me, the McDonald's thing. Mm -hmm. He did a, a thing on AI and on robots and, and artificial intelligence. And there was an experiment where these little dinky robots were uh, developed. And they're one of their things that they were tasked with, their, their programming was, was when their energy got low, they would go to their battery source, their charging source, and recharge their batteries, and then go on about their tasks. And they begin to observe, and this was not in their programming, this was not in anything that anybody had done to them, that while they were acting on their own, there were some of the little robots that would go and hog the power source and try and keep the power source from the other robots. That developed all on its own, okay? So AI, we're, we're not even prepared 
for AI. We shouldn't even be messing with this the way that we're messing with this. That's not just me saying this. This is some of our top scientists saying, whoa, we need to pump the brakes on this thing. And my contention is if there are spirits that can manipulate doors and make them close, if they can make objects appear and disappear, which I've experienced, what's going to keep them from messing with the AI and doing something with the AI? Wow. Now, I'm not saying it's satanic or demonic or malevolent. I'm just saying that so there's some of these beings on the other side. They're not human. They're not human hearted. Some of them have pretty wild senses of humor. What's to prevent them from getting a hold of the AI and going, watch this? <laughs> That's amazing. That's an amazing point. I have never thought of that. And it is yeah. super scary. And it's something I, I, we actually wanted to ask you about, John, about how do you view the intersection of the paranormal and what people view as traditional science? Yeah. Well, you know, the problem with traditional science is that it's nowhere near uh, understanding, explaining, connecting properly with the paranormal. It's just like Skinwalker Ranch. And I've communicated with uh, with Brandon a few times through Twitter and said, hey, Brandon, science is great, but you got to get the, the vetted psychics, the shamans, the mediums out there, because again, you're getting a demonstration. We set these rockets off. It veered off course. One was destroyed. We saw this blob in the air doing this thing. Okay, that's a demonstration. What is the blob? Who is the blob? Why is the blob there? What's it trying to communicate? It's making a visual demonstration that here I am. I can I can control these things, manipulate these things, but who is it? Why is it? So on and so forth. And so what we have to do, we have to integrate science and we have to integrate the paranormal. And the way that we go into that, the skeptical scientists have to get rid of that and go in and be open-minded enough to say, okay, something's going on here. Let's see if we can quantify it. And the psychics who have been derided and abused and mocked have to say, okay, I'm going to put that aside. I'm going to give these scientists a chance. I'm going to go in here and let's work with them and, and trust that they're not going to call me some kind of fruitcake or something because I believe this way. And when we do that, that's when we're going to really begin to make progress, integrate this and get some further understanding of what's going on, how and why, and how do we better integrate this? You know, we're, we're woefully behind psychically and scientifically. We're behind psychically because people hold to dogma, tradition, ritual that doesn't amount to hill of beans and isn't the truth. So they continue to interpret things through that way. Oh, don't use a Ouija board. You're going to get an attachment. You're going to get rid of. So we're stuck with that. We're stuck with science going, this is BS and it doesn't exist. These people are deluded. They're imagining things and blah, blah, blah. So we're stuck with that. So we have to work past and through those paradigms, find some way to merge them successfully. And then as we were talking about before we became live on the air here, there's a buddy of mine that uh, was at Stanford uh, when they developed Stanford Research Institute. He did not work for SRI, but he was there when they developed it. He was there when Putoff and Targ and Geller and all these people were there doing all these things. And he was there when the, the three-letter alphabet agencies came by and threw tons and tons of money at this thing because it worked. <laughs> And John, um, if I can interrupt real quick for our yeah, listeners, you, you, you mentioned Geller and you're, you're speaking of Yuri Geller, correct? Yes. Yes. And I met him by the way. And, uh, and I write about that in my second book. And for all those that wonder, yes, he's the real deal. Um, so this guy was there when all this was going on. And uh, he told me something one time that blew my mind and illustrated the fact about how we approach paranormal phenomena. They were doing remote viewing and they had a target and the guy drew the target the guy the target was a guy sitting on a bench and it was close to these uh, a railroad track like a, a public rail like think you know when you're in new york you take the train to go somewhere or something so it was something like that so the remote viewer gets the guy on the bench gets the surrounding buildings and the trees or whatever is there and he gets the railroad tracks so the uh, the three letter alphabet agency guy is looking at this thing. He goes, well, this is a success. And my buddy looked at it and he said, where's the train? He said, what do you mean? He said, where's the train? He said, well, 
what do you mean where's the train? He said he's sitting at a, at a public train a public train stop. Where's the train? And, and the guy said, I don't, I don't understand what you mean. He said, well, think of it this way. And when my friend was telling me this, he said, you're a photographer, so you'll understand this. And I did. He said, your remote viewer is a manual camera on a slow speed setting with slow speed film. And so if the train goes by, he's not going to record the train. He's not going to see it. The remote viewer is not going to get it. And that's one of the first things you learn as a photographer. In a photography course I took, it was like you're on a busy Manhattan street. And there's tons of people walking there all the time. We, we used to live up in New York. And they said, you want to take the picture of just the building, but you don't want the people in that picture. How do you do that? You put the camera on a tripod, you use a slow shutter speed. The people blur out of existence when they walk by the building sharp as a tack. So we said, your remote viewer is a slow speed camera <laughs> with slow speed film. And so when the train goes by, your remote viewer is not picking up the train. And so the, the three letter alphabet agency guy says, well, I, I don't understand how that's relevant. You know, what, we've got the thing. It's a success. We've got the target. And he says, yeah, but what if you refine this and train your remote viewer to be a high speed camera set on a high speed setting with high speed film? He's going to pick up the train when it goes by also. And the guy was like, eh, that's all right. It's a success. We got what we wanted. And that was it. So that's the mindset of some of these people that were in these processes. And, you know, it's like, I look at everything. I look at everything I do today after 50 years of doing this professionally, after all these experiences I've had. And I say, how can I make this better? How can I get better? How can I go deeper? How can I make this more effective? You know, and so that's one of the things that we encounter is we have to say, OK, how much further can we take this? And I think one of the most frustrating things is like EVP. You know, uh, EVP goes back to people think uh, Rod Ive or Rod Ive or whatever. It doesn't. It goes way back further than that. I wrote a book. On, uh, I didn't write a book. I read a book on the history of EVP, and I was astonished because it goes way, 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 way back. And for all of these years, now when when EVP started out, for the most part, people would get <laughs> Ralph. Okay. Or they might get a, a short phrase or whatever. Okay. Now here we are in 2023. We've got electronics out the wazoo. We've got all kinds of sophisticated software. We've got the best recorders and everything else. What do we get? <laughs> Ralph. <laughs> We're at the same place for Christ's sakes all yes. these years later. So I was talking with this, this uh, person that I was on a podcast. And he was one of the interviewers there. And he's also a professional musician. And he said, John, he said, I can take any sound. Any, any spoken thing, any piece of music, I can put it in the software. I can manipulate it, isolate it, tweak it, change it, do anything in the world I want to with it. And he said, I can put this EVP in there. I can hear these voices. I cannot find the frequency that they're on. I can find the frequency that you're on when you talk to me. I can find the frequency of this piece of music. I can find the frequency of this instrument. I can't find the frequency that these voices utilize to speak to us. And he and I agreed that... When we find that frequency that they're utilizing, that's when we're going to have real time two way communication with these intelligences on the other side. So we have such a long way to go. We think we've progressed. We haven't progressed very much. And like I said, there's so many things in the way that keep mm -hmm. us from making that progression. And those are the things we need to solve and come together with, with a common attitude. One of the things that gets in the way of that is ego. Uh, we had, uh, when I was young, and I write about this in my books, uh, when I was young, we developed a, a circle at the house, spiritualist circle. And, <clears throat> excuse me, our purpose was to communicate with the other side and to use that in a practical way. And so we would take somebody that lived in another city that we all knew that needed healing. <clears throat> excuse me. And what we would do is, Ekankar was popular at the time. Inner peace movement was popular at the time, a lot of other things. So we would say, okay, if you come in with mainly a Christian viewpoint and you want to pray, pray. If you come in, want to use an Ekankar technique, do that. 
If you want to come in and use a, a technique from inner peace movement, do that. If you want to use Buddhism, do that. <coughs> Excuse me. Whatever you want to do, use that technique, but don't expect me to have to use your technique. We'll all use all of the techniques that we're comfortable with, but we will focus all of those techniques and all of that energy toward one thing, healing Joe Blow. So everybody would do that. And then somebody would call Joe Blow a few weeks later and say, and not mention that we were working on him, just say, hey, how you doing? How you? Well, you know what? I've been feeling a lot better. My health is better. I'm, I'm able to get out and about. I'm doing better. My doctor's amazed. So it worked. But then egos came in. Well, we always meet at your house. When can, why can't we meet at my house one time? Uh, you know, we always use, why can't we use this technique or do that? Or I just read this brand new book came out. And, oh, this technique is, it just solves everything. you got to have everything. Let's use this technique. Let's do this thing. So egos got in the way, and it destroyed it. And that's the problem that we have here is that instead of everybody coming in and say, okay, I'm going to use what I use. It works for me. You use what you use. It works for you. You use what you use. Let's direct all that energy concentrated together and focused together for this purpose. And that's where we need to go. <clears throat> when we do that amongst ourselves with science, with a marriage of science and the paranormal, that's when we're going to start getting some results. John, you have so many talents and quite the the wild background of everything that you've seen and you've experienced. I feel like we would need 10 shows to cover all that you have done. And we're thankful that you have your, your books for people to, to pick up. And do you have a website that people can visit to learn more about you? Yeah, johnrussell.net. Just go John to johnrussell.net. Yeah. Wonderful. I'll put that in the okay. chat as well. Yeah. JohnRussell.net. And, um, you know, you were mentioning that when you were younger in your 20s, you had this UFO experience. And at the time, nobody was going to talk about it. We've made such large strides in the UAP yeah. world that now everybody is talking about it. And um, before you go this evening, and again, we're, thank you, we're so thankful to have had you here. Oh, have you pleasure. seen any strides in the, the realm of psychic investigation in terms of how seriously people take it? And if not, what can we do to, um, to help there? What, what can everybody do to, to put more faith in that area? Well, you know, the pendulum always swings both ways. And, you know, back in the era when I had the UFO experience, you didn't talk about it. You were made fun of. You could lose your job, uh, so on and so forth. Then the pendulum kind of swung the other way. People became more interested in things. People opened up more. Uh, you saw psychics on the, the daytime talk shows and so on and so forth. And then the pendulum swung back the other way a little bit and people kind of lost interest. And then now it's come up a little bit with the public UFO disclosures and so on and so forth. But I've observed that it's kind of beginning to swing back the other way. Now people are beginning to lose interest a little bit. Um, there's some people, there's podcasts that I've been on where people in the, in the chats have said, uh, the guy lost me the second he said he was a psychic. I don't believe in psychics. That's BS. That's nonsense, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it kind of swings the other way. So, we're kind of beginning to see a little bit of that disrespect again. And I think the longer our government drags their feet, uh, the more people are going to lapse back into a disbelieving attitude because they're saying, see, there's nothing there. If there was, I would have revealed it. And, and people get tired. They get fatigued. And um, they wait for nothing. It doesn't come. And they, they just lapse back into their regular, you know, however they are. I think with psychics, you know, that's always been a sore spot because you've had Miss Cleo and all of these people out there like that, that that taint the profession and people are aware of that. And I think the problem that we have with people coming to psychics is a person wants to come to psychic and I want the psychic to be God. Mm -hmm. You know, tell me my future husband's full name, his social security <laughs> address and the date that he's coming, you know. And uh, I don't want to pray. I don't want to meditate. I don't want to study. I don't want to learn anything. I just want all this to be right. How do I do that? Well, that's not the way it works, you know. And so there's a lot of education there that we have to do still. There's so many misconceptions and there's so many people that have done so many fraudulent things that have hurt the profession and hurt investigation and, and all these things. And of course, the TV shows don't help. So we have a long way to go. We have a lot to go. Uh, we have to take it seriously. We have to be responsible with it. And then likewise, 
extend that out and get others to be. And we have to call out the fakes and the phonies, just like they did with the big TV personality that they said, hey, this guy's been caught faking stuff. We got to call it out and we got to be honest about it. And we got to we got to, you know, go from there. So for your final thoughts, what would be your advice to those who are maybe skeptics currently? You know, if you're a healthy skeptic, that's good. I'm one of the most skeptical psychics you'll ever meet for all of my experiences, everything I've experienced. I have a healthy skepticism and that's good. You should be. That keeps you from being in the jungle, drinking the poison Kool-Aid. That's a good thing. If you're just a jerk, (laughs) <laughs> goes into every situation going, this is BS, this is nonsense, this guy's deluded, this is fake, there's no such thing, then you're never going to experience anything, you're never going to learn anything, or if you do, you're going to write it off as imagination, that was coincidence, I didn't have enough sleep, uh, you know, whatever. So healthy skepticism in a proper way is a good thing. Just being a jerk, that's, you know, you can't help those people. You can't deal with those people. That's like James Randi, the magician that made it his life work to destroy Uri Geller. And, uh, you know, his determination going, uh, before we go, if we got time, do we have time real quick? Yes. I gotta, yeah. I gotta tell you this. Um, James Randi uh, did a, a program one time, you know, he had the million dollar reward for any psychic that could prove their powers. Right. So he did a program one time on this program. He had this object and there was a psychic that said he could psychometrize things, tell where things had been from, what they were, and blah, blah, blah. So Randy said, I had this object a friend gave to me. Nobody knew where it came from. Not many people knew about it. And I knew if this psychic got anything at all from this object, it would have to be the real thing. So the psychic comes, Randy gives him the object. Lo and behold, Randy, by his own admission, says, this guy tells me, the description of the guy that gave me this object and where it came from and blah, blah, blah. And he's telling me all these things. And so far he's a hundred percent correct. Now this is friggin' Randy saying this in his own damn show. Yeah. And then he says, the guy says that there's something unusual about the guy's neck, his friend, the way he dresses, there's something odd about his neck here. And he said that he didn't say it was a clerical collar. He said, kind of reminds me of a clerical collar, the way a clerical collar comes up. And Randy goes, nope, you're wrong. He doesn't wear a clerical collar. You're, you're wrong. That's it. No million dollar prize for you. <laughs> so Randy said, if you get nine things right and one thing that he considers wrong, it's all wrong. How do you go against that? So I was on a radio show. And this is when I lived up in New York and I was on a radio show and the guy called me one day and he said, um, I said, we're, we're not on the air today, are we? And he said, no, no, no. He said, listen, he said, you'll never guess who I got as a guest. I said, who? And he said, the amazing Randy, James Randy. I said, oh my God, you're kidding me. And he goes, no. And he said, can you call in while he's on the air? I said, ah, dang it, I can't. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so full, I, I can't be there that day. And he said, well, at least give me a couple of questions to ask him. And I said, okay. Ask him about this case with the guy that was 100% accurate till this thing. Okay, and then what else? And I said, ask Randy if you're being totally, completely honest. Totally, completely honest. Haven't you had at least one experience in your life that you can explain by rational means? He said, okay. So... Come to find out, the uh, the friend that Randy had, the guy said, there's something unusual about his neck. There's something in here that reminds me of a clerical collar that sticks up like that. The guy's friend wore turtleneck sweaters all the time. <sighs> so there was that thing about his neck, and it's like, okay. So the guy was right, but Randy said, no, it wasn't a clerical collar. Well, the guy didn't say it was a clerical collar. So he asked him about that. So Randy said, if one thing's wrong, everything's wrong. And he said, well, that's not fair. And he said, the guy didn't say it was a, he said, well, that was the way I interpreted it. And I interpreted it was wrong. And if one thing's wrong, everything's wrong. Well, there's your typical skeptic. Okay. So you can't beat that. You can't combat that. You can't get around that. So then my friend asked him the next question. And he said, well, you know, if you're being totally honest, haven't you ever had? And Randy's response was no. Next question. (laughs) This is, this is skeptics. And you know, it's like people go into this, determined to be a jerk 
determined to, you know, there's nothing to this. My mind's made up. If you can't give me the winning lottery numbers, you're a fraud. And that's mm -hmm. how people go into this thing. So, you know, there's, I've done this for over 50 years professionally. I've had all these experiences. The older I get, the less I know and the more I wished I knew and the more I want to know. And so we have to go into it with that respectful, open-minded attitude. And that's where we make our progress. My takeaway folks is don't be a jerk. Don't have some respect. Yeah. <laughs> Go tonight. into it, yes, that's with a respectful good. attitude and an open mind, right? That's, that's what we always that's say good. on here. Keep your minds open. Well, John, we are so grateful to you for joining us and for those that tuned all. in. I've learned so much and loved hearing all about your experiences. And I feel like it was Thank just you. the tip of the iceberg, really. I uh, feel we'll, like there's we'll a whole lot I, more I got to tell Russell. you about the, the dead pets that came back to visit me. And the oh, my and goodness. All kinds of things. <laughs> yes. Yeah. We need to we need to have a whole episode on just. We'll do it again. We'll do it again. Spirits yes, from please. beyond. Yes. Great. Thank you guys so much. It's been a real pleasure. I enjoyed it. And uh, thank the listeners and, and really happy to be here. And we'll do it again. Uh, thank you. Tim, any thank final you. thoughts? Yes, indeed. You know, just like Andrew Bustamani from Beyond Skinwalker Ranch told us, you know, folks that have an open mind, they tend to be more intelligent and more successful in life. Yes. So that's what I recommend. Get off your screens, folks. The skies are not classified the woods are not classified yet. That's right. Get out. <laughs> look up at the sky. That's what I'm going to do as soon as we get off the show. You can have these experiences for yes. yourself. Yeah. Yes, you can. Go for a hike. See what you can experience. Yes. There it is. All right, everybody. Stay happy. Stay strange. And keep listening to all things unexplained. Until Thanks, next John. Time. Thank you. Thanks. Like. Share. Follow. All things unexplained. Swag and much more at linktree.com slash a t u podcast bigfoot u f o dot com so some of that i think sir will say for closed session <laughs>